الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام الأتمان الأكملان على خير خلق الله أجمعين نبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد All praise is due to Allah, the Almighty, the Majestic. We praise Him the way He deserves to be praised. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to exalt the mention and grant peace and send His blessings and salutations upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Brothers and sisters in faith, I am overwhelmed with excitement, but because I am restricted to a very tight corner, I can't be doing my uh, usual obnoxious uh, expression of excitement. I think some of you have seen it in various forms. But because I'm behind the camera, I'm going to contain myself and try to convert this excitement into verbatim and words and terminologies that we can is a very great concept that is often overlooked and disregarded. Uh, because we either don't understand what the Muslim means or we don't understand what household means or we don't understand either or neither. The truth of the matter is for us to understand what we're aiming for here, we need to define most important as they say the elephant in the room. The elephant in the room is the word Muslim. Why is being a Muslim important today? Because today more than ever, being a Muslim has become the treasure of all treasures. The most valuable asset that you've ever acquired, possessed, and continue to maintain is you being a Muslim. A lot of people look at that because of our cultural upbringing as some sort of natural consequence of having my father Abdullah and my mother Khadija uh, or Fatima or Aisha, whatever her name may be. So as a byproduct of my parents, I'm a Muslim. But the truth of the matter is, if you look at Islam as merely something that you've inherited from your parents, then we're definitely starting off on the wrong foot. And our path and mission will become a lot more complicated and a lot more complex. You have to, you and me, each and every one of us has to look at Islam as a gift from Allah that we engage and not as a gift from Allah that we inherited from our parents. Because if we were to look at it merely as something that we inherited from our parents, that makes us no different really than a Jew or a Christian or a Buddhist. Allahumma accept that we are upon the truth. Nevertheless, in terms of our engagement with the religion, we will be at that bare minimum and the bare minimum is not enough. The bare minimum is not enough. So the true understanding of Islam and Muslim is that you understand that Allah gifted you this religion and Allah selected you from among the multitudes of people he created to be someone who bears witness that he is the only one worthy of worship and that Muhammad is his messenger. This is so important today when you are exposed to all types of ideologies, all types of philosophies, all types of religions, all types of isms that are calling, to, calling you to everything except that. And not only that, in the process, Islam is always looked down upon and belittled and, and demonized as a religion of backwards people, people that are from the uh, Stone Age and so uncivilized and so on and so forth. So for some youth, uh, they have a problem in identifying with Islam because it's not the hip and the cool thing. But wait a second. Reflect on this properly. In terms of what matters, let me ask you a question and you can answer this question even though I won't hear you answer. Who really cares? And who are you trying to please? If you're trying to please mankind, surprise! It's not going to happen. It is not going to happen. Human beings are so difficult to please. They are the most impossible things to please. In fact, by pleasing any group of people, you are automatically displeasing the others. I'll give you an example. Allow me to have a sip of coffee. Bismillah. I'll give you an example. A Muslim speaker, a da'i of any sort, wants to sympathize 
with the uh, a certain community of people that does not follow the Islamic guidelines. As soon as he sympathizes with them, he automatically will have a group of Muslims at his case, like, why are you doing this? Why are you watering down the religion? Why are you changing things? Why are you switching things up? While he pleased that group of people by saying some words of empathy or sympathy, he automatically created for himself enemies with, within. And vice versa. If he were to say what he believes is pleasing to Allah, he's automatically going to have an issue with the people that think that he's some sort of extremist. So the bottom line is that no matter how you look at it, you are bound to be in trouble with some group of people. If this is the case, then who are you supposed to please? The creator of people. That is the best, most beautiful, practical solution ever. And I don't understand how we human beings tend to overlook and ignore this fundamental fact. I'm speaking about myself. All of us are guilty to some degree that at some point we decide to please a creature like us on the expense of displeasing the creator of this creature. What we need to bring to mind is that on the day of judgment, when it's all said and done and there's a paradise and there's hell, no one is going to be able to intercede on your behalf because you please them in this dunya. If it entails displeasing Allah. As for the one who calls the shots, makes the decisions and determines where one of us winds up, it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it is upon us to understand that identifying with Islam and calling yourself a Muslim is you signing a contract with the creator of the heavens and the earth. And tell me if there's a better contract than that. Tell me if there's any, anyone who can guarantee you to stick to the, uh, uh, stipul the stip stipulated uh, rules of any contract better than Allah. Sign a contract with any entity. You have no idea what will happen later. They might take you to court, find a lawyer and nullify the whole thing. The most guaranteed contract you will ever sign is the one with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah promised that the believers will be rewarded. Allah promised that he will never oppress a single human being. And your Lord does not oppress anyone and anybody. That is the best contract. So when you identify with the term Muslim, then you are on the right track. You have a contract with Allah. There's nothing for you to be ashamed of. And when we say Muslim, this is where I invite myself and you to upgrade our Islam on every possible level. A Muslim should be the most studious student in terms of school for the teenager. A Muslim should be the number one in his sports team. A Muslim should be the most athletic. A Muslim should be the most health conscious. A Muslim should be the most religious. A Muslim should be the most knowledgeable, the most sophisticated, the most aware of everything around him. A Muslim has to be the leader in any given business, in any given position. You should be the person in lead. You should be calling the shots. You should be the boss. Not a Muslim that you go by a kandura and then you, you know, you dishevel yourself and you look like you came uh, you took a vacation from the graveyard for a couple of days and then you live a life of so-called asceticism and you ignore the rights of people and the rights are of your neighbors and you don't give da'wah and you don't live up to the standards of Islam. You don't emulate the Prophet Sallallahu who used to appear very handsome and very clean, very well dressed, very, his hair used to be taken care of, he used to braid his hair alayhi salatu his, his odor was the greatest thing you will ever smell. Today, some Muslims, you can't even go by them. You can't even stand next to them in Salah because of the stench and the smell. And we consider this to be that because that's the perception. That's the perception that comes to the, the minds of the people. Muslim, meaning someone who's, you know, miskeen, miskeen, you, you blow on him, he flies away. Why? Was Umar ibn Khattab like this? I ask you by Allah. Was Abu Bakr Siddiq like this? Was Uthman ibn Affan like this? Was Ali bin Abi Talib like this? If I give you only this four khulafa, only this four khulafa, and we discuss the traits of each one of them, your mind will be baffled. Each one of them was a leader in the ultimate sense in his own, in his, in his own way. 
Uthman Na'afan was, was a millionaire. He was a businessman in the ultimate sense. He spoke about entrepreneurship. Uthman ibn Affan is the ultimate person who led a business and made money. Abu Bakr was, was the leader, the reliable person who when the Prophet ﷺ died and the people were panicking, he had the, the guts, he had the courage, he had the, the ability, he was well spoken to stand and say, مَنْ كَانَ يَعْبُدُ مُحَمَّدْ فَأَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا قَدْ مَاتْ صَلَّى اللَّهُ وَسَلَّمْ وَمَنْ كَانَ يَعْبُدُ اللَّهُ فَإِنَّ اللَّهُ حَيٌّ لَا يَمُوتُ Whosoever worships Muhammad, Muhammad ﷺ had passed away. And whosoever worships Allah, then Allah is the ever living who never dies. You know what it takes for you to be able to stand in front of people like Mu'ad ibn Jabal and Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas and all of these Sahaba and say something like this to them and Umar ibn al-Khattab who himself was panicking Ali radiallahu anhu. Then what about Umar and his courage and his strength? The shaitan used to avoid him when he would see him on, on, on a road. Umar was al-Farooq. Ali ibn Abi Talib, the, the, the warrior that is unprecedented. Strength, physical ability, power. That's a Muslim. When we say Muslim, that's a Muslim. Not some, some flimsy, uh, flimsy fella that can't speak, can't uh, express himself, can't relate his deen, can't convey Islam to anyone, does not even know Surah Al-Ikhlas to explain it to a Christian so that that Christian can enter into Islam. That's the sad reality. But they know everything else in the world. Everything else in the world. And sometimes even the worldly matters are not known. So then it's just a complete failure on both ends of the scope. So that's a Muslim. This is, this is our, what we should aspire to be. It's a, it's a goal that we should strive towards on daily basis and we are all falling short. But our success is with Allah Where's the effort? Where's that mindset? It's the mindset. It begins right here. That's the Muslim. The household is where all these Muslims gather. So imagine if you had a father with this mentality and this leadership and then a mother with this mentality and this leadership, and then a son and a daughter and so on and so forth. Everybody's on the same note. What do you think it's going to be like in this house? What type of household would you be looking at? You're going to be looking at a household that is Mubarak. It's a blessed household that the shayateen do not even want to enter. Why don't they want to enter? Because in this house, there isn't 50 cents rapping in the background. There isn't music popping in the background. There isn't the type of pictures being hung on the wall. You know, the dog living in the house so that the angels don't enter. It's a household that people are reciting the Quran, people are establishing the Salah. The men are praying in the masjid, the women are praying at home, praying as early as the time come in. It's a household where Allah's government is being established. Where Islam is the, the, the deciding factor in everything. Not a perfect family, no way on earth. We are not perfect, we will not be perfect, but the mindset and the foundation is as such. And then Allah Azza wa is the one who facilitates and brings ease and makes it happen. So this is the idea of the Muslim household. It is a place where everybody is working together towards this. And what would be the most important thing? If I want to speak about the Muslim household, there are many subcategories that we will discuss, inshallah, over the course of these seven to eight sessions. But let us begin with the most fundamental and some of the benefits of having a Muslim household. First and foremost, it is a place where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is never associated with. The Muslim household is a place where Tawheed is established firmly, where everybody knows La ilaha illallah with its conditions, and what it entails and its ramifications and its consequences. It is a place where no one calls on other than Allah. It is not a house where people believe in superstition. And how many of our households, brothers and sisters all over the world, they are, they, they are built on superstitions. We, a lot of us come from this background and it's very difficult to kick. It's very difficult to remove it from your life. Did you know that when I was a kid, <laughs> when I was a kid, we believed that if you were lying down on the ground and one of your family members walked over you, that you will not grow tall anymore. And do you know that when one of my family members did this, I would cry for hours, begging them to reverse it. If you walk over me, you step over me, you have to now step back so that I can resume growing taller. Otherwise, I will not grow tall anymore. Do you know what kind of trauma this will have you go through? Because 
we were, you know, these things were not taught. Alhamdulillah, it's all in the past. May Allah Azza wa Jal bless my, my, my mother specifically, my parents. Alhamdulillah, all this has been thrown in a dustbin. But at some point in our lives, when Islam wasn't the governing force of the house, that's what we believed. If you open the umbrella in the house, yee, musibah. It's a calamity. Uh, and you know, an airstrike is about to land in the house. And don't you dare drop the salt. Shaker. And the list goes on and you cannot leave your slipper upside down. <laughs> if your slipper is upside down, that means the, it's, it's, it's disrespecting Allah. And I could give you endless stories about nonsense that we used to believe. And that's, uh, you know, a lot of people still live by these rules. Your left hand itches, you're going to pay. Your right hand itches, you're going to get paid. Or the other way around, I don't remember which is which. You know, you're, you hear uh, some beeping in your ear, someone speaking about you. Ya Sheikh. Ya Sheikh, at'abtu abuna, Sheikh. Enough of this nonsense and this craziness. A Muslim household doesn't have a, a blue eye, you know, hanging to protect you from the evil eye or some horseshoe or some rabbit's foot or something. And surely they're not calling on the Messenger of Allah alayhi salam or Abdul Qadir al-Jilani or some other Sheikh of the Mashaykh. So it's, it's a house that is established upon Tawheed. And so therefore, their fear, their reliance, their fasting, their dhikr of Allah, their every aspect, every act of worship is for Allah alone. قُلْ إِنَّ صَلَاتِي وَنُسُكِي وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَمَاتِي لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Say verily, my salah and my sacrifice and my life and my death are for Allah, the Lord of the world. لَا شَرِيكَ لَهَ He has no partners. A Muslim household is one where the people follow the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So they sit down when they drink and they, be, they put on the right shoe first and then uh, they take off the left one first. When they enter the bathroom, they enter with the left foot. They make the dua before entering. They, they say Bismillah before they eat. They eat with the right hand. All of these etiquettes and all of these things which we will discuss later inshallah are observed. And those are the easiest things in the world. Subhanallah, we are so lazy. They're so easy. You learn them once, you apply them for the rest of your life. But if, you're, if the parents are not mindful of that and constantly reminding the children, the children have the tendency to forget. So it's an obligation. The, ha the Muslim household is one where the Quran is being recited. The Prophet ﷺ said, مَثَلُ الْبَيْتِ الَّذِي يُذْكَرُ اللَّهُ فِيهِ وَالْبَيْتِ الَّذِي لَا يُذْكَرُ اللَّهُ فِيهِ مِثْلُ الْحَيِّ وَالْمَيِّتِ The example of the, of the house in which Allah is being remembered and the house in which Allah is not being remembered is like the, diff is like the example or the similitude of the living and the dead. Either you are alive or dead, depending on whether you are remembering Allah or not. It's very easy to say the adhkar of the morning after Salatul Fajr, just my advice to you. After Salatul Fajr, because now we're in quarantine, nobody's leaving for the most part, you're not going out, you finish Salatul Fajr on your bed before you knock out. Again, if you're sleeping after Fajr, you say the adhkar of the morning. And in the evening, after Asr, if you're going to have a nap, before you, while you're trying to sleep, you say the adhkar. It actually, it's, it's soothing. It's soothing for you and it's, it helps you transition into sleep. The Muslim household has a lot of other traits. Uh, wherein the main objective is that the angels are admitted and the shayateen are kicked out. Because if the shayateen are running around in the house, you better believe it's going to be some rough times and difficult days. طيب. Of course, Bismillah. Of course, there's a lot more to say, but I would like to actually start digging deeper. Let us dig deeper. Okay, take a breath and give you a chance to take a breath. Because I get a little excited sometimes and I go at a fast, uh, you know, third, fourth gear. And people always tell me to slow down a little bit. So we'll slow down a little bit. All right. So we established the Muslim household. We are proud of our identity as Muslims. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Alhamdulillah, Wallahi, Wallahi, Wallahi. If there's one thing I want to highlight and I'm, I'm really sincere is that I, I love listening to debates. I enjoy listening to debates when I'm shaving my head. Uh, and a lot of people have a problem with shaving the head. I'll discuss that later. Don't don't give fatawa. Uh, some people get so excited. Oh, it's a khawarij. It's a quote, the trait of the khawarij. So one of the traits of the khawarij is that they used to recite Quran all the time and pray for a long time and fast every day. Type. So you're going to stop doing those because the khawarij did it. Calm down, read the fatawa, understand what the scholars have said, and then you could uh, get excited. 
everybody does what is suitable for them as long as it's within the boundaries of the Quran and Sunnah. We don't want to shift the topic, but when I'm shaving, when I'm doing my own thing, when I'm sitting, you know, sometimes even work, I listen to debates. And I enjoy listening to debates between Muslims and Christians, and between Christians and atheists, and between Muslims and atheists. Because I always want to see the perspective of Christians when they uh, argue with atheists and how they try to, you know, how they have to convince them that there is a God and then the challenge of saying that God is actually a triune God. And, you know, you, 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 you listen to these and you watch these videos and you have these so-called intellectuals, you know, people that appear to be very eloquent, very well-spoken, obviously educated. A lot of them are PhDs and doctors and, and so on and so forth. And then you see that these people are struggling with believing that there's a lot. Not struggling. They don't even want to believe. And the people are struggling to convince them that Allah Azza wa Jal exists. And that there's recompense. And that there's, uh, uh, you know, a day of judgment. And there's uh, emancipation from, from eternal hellfire uh, through salvation and belief versus eternal damnation. Yeah, and, you, and you listen... And then you say, Subhanallah, how, how, how could this be? How, كَيْفَ تَكْفُرُونَ بِاللَّهِ How do you disbelieve in Allah? وَكُنْتُمْ أَمْوَاتًا And used to be dead. ثُمَّ أَحْيَكُمْ Then Allah gave you life. Then Allah will cause you to die. Then He will bring you to life once again. كَيْفَ تَكْفُرُونَ بِاللَّهِ How do you disbelieve in Allah? How can a human being disbelieve in Allah? And then I, 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 I also like to watch documentaries especially war documentaries and when you watch war documentaries or documentaries i'm sorry if you're british i don't know how i'm supposed to say it documentaries um with an arab accent when you watch these things and then you see what human beings are capable of in terms of violence and crime how humans can hurt others and kill others and violate others and oppress others and they don't even think about accountability on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. It baffles me. It baffles me to the greatest degree ever. How? How? They, they, no fear. No fear of accountability. No fear of judgment. No fear of being brought one day and made to stand before Allah and you will be asked. And when your mouth is sealed, your hands will testify and your legs will testify and your limbs will testify and your eyes will testify and everything will testify against you. It makes you appreciate Islam over and over again. Every day we appreciate, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah. I believe in Islam. I'm a Muslim. I believe in Islam. I have no complexity in my religion. I don't have to be a philosopher to understand who God is. I don't need some 60 people to try to break it down for me. And it's still against logic. As in the case with Christianity, I don't need any of that. It's all plain and simple. As Allah Azza wa Jal described it, that what the truth eliminates and destroys falsehood. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful blessing. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Appreciate being a Muslim every single day. And as a, as a part of the belief or the foundation of the Muslim household is that we have to observe certain manners and etiquettes with certain entities. I'm going to say entities because it is not restricted to mankind. In fact, the most important type of adab to ever have is al-adab ma'Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How to have... I'm going to say, يعني, to translate adab is a little challenging or to explain it, it could take maybe 15 minutes. But let's just say that it is يعني, أن يكون الإنسان على ما ينبغي أن يكون عليه في أحواله. يعني الأحسن حال. That the, the most ideal state that you can be in. As long as you can. Being in that epitome the state of epitome, the highest point of being mindful of Allah and observing manners with Him at all times. Al-adab ma'Allah is one of the most important things that a human being can have. And unfortunately, a lot of us, uh, we observe good manners with our neighbors, we observe good manners with our colleagues at work, we observe good manners with our bosses, especially if we're scared of them. 
but we fail to observe the proper manners with Allah. I'm going to say primarily because we probably don't know what it is. So let us know and learn together what is it that will uh, entitle you to be among the people who is observing adab ma' Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. First and foremost, and the most comprehensive definition ever given by anyone is the one given by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when Jibreel asked him an ihsan. Qala akhbirni an al-ihsan. Tell me about ihsan. Excellence. Qala an ta'bud Allah ka anna ka tarah fa in lam takun tarahu fa innahu yarak. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to worship Allah as though you see him, but if you don't and you cannot see him, then know that he sees you. The scholars explain that, that the first one is the one where you're worshiping Allah out of love and anticipation. And if you cannot reach that level, then at least out of fear by bearing in mind that Allah Azza wa Jal sees you. Meaning if you cannot bring yourself up to the level where you are so excited that you're worshiping Allah that you as if you're looking at him subhanahu wa ta'ala, at least remember that he is looking at you. And if we were to observe this definition, then يعني, you'll be hard pressed to really go off track. And if you go off track, it will not be long before you come back on track. Because you're always mindful of the fact that Allah Azza wa Jal is observing you. And even better than that, you want Allah to be pleased with you. So you make that extra effort. It's like, you know, uh, to give you a worldly example and to Allah belongs the great, greatest example. But just to bring the point home. It's like you have a boss and, and there are two types of employees. One type of employee who is proactive, who, who does the extra work, and then he wants the management to observe, to see his effort. So he's out there putting himself in, in the spotlight to be seen, you know, that I am working hard, I'm going out of my way. So he has this kind of dedication and loyalty to the management to prove himself. And the second one is the one where he doesn't really want to be in the spotlight because he's not really at that level. He doesn't have that love, that anticipation, that courage, that drive to be there. So he's just yeah, hanging in there, you know, away from the spotlight, managing. But that doesn't mean, in this case, in the case of Ihsan, it doesn't mean now that he starts slacking off. No, he's still mindful that the management is watching him. Allahumma, he's not right there trying to put it in their face. I hope that you know you, you can relate to what I'm saying. And of course, to Allah belongs the greatest uh, similitude and example. We're just trying to have you relate to what we're saying. And if you really want to understand a, a concept of, of Adam Allah, then you have to speak about Al Haya. Al Haya, which is uh, modesty and shy, bashfulness, being shy, being bashful. Of course, uh, there are two types of shyness there's the praiseworthy and the blameworthy. The praiseworthy is the one that prevents you from acting. Uh, in a manner that is not appropriate. The blameworthy one is where the one that prevents you from being able to speak the truth or from being able to share Islam or from being able to, you know, uh, uh, stand up for the truth. You, you shy away from it and that is blameworthy. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Hadith of Mas'ud, he said, istahyu, istah, istahyu min Allahi haqq al -haya. He said, be shy and bashful of Allah the way he deserves. قُلْنَا يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ إِنَّا نَسْتَحِيَ وَالْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ said, uh, Ibn Mas'ud said, we said, oh Messenger of Allah, we are shy, alhamdulillah. قَالَ لَيْسَ ذَاكَ He said, no, it's not that type of haya that you are referring to. وَلَكِنَّ الْإِسْتِحْيَاءَ مِنَ اللَّهِ حَقَّ الْحَيَاءَ أَنْ تَحْفَظَ الرَّأْسَ وَمَا وَعَى اللَّهُ أَكْبَرُ Being mindful of Allah or being shy of Allah the way He deserves is that you observe the mind and what you put in it. What, your, what kind of information you're taking in. So you read, uh, you know, about magic and you read about nonsense and you read about superstitious stuff. You feed yourself this kind of junk, then guess what? You're going to become a junkie. وَالْبَطْنَ وَمَا حَوَى Hello, hello. Now you wonder why I'm always talking about fitness. Bear witness why I talk about fitness. Because that hadith says you have to observe your belly and what you put in it, huh? What you're, what you're putting in your mouth and going down to your stomach, 
that therefore affects you in every way, shape or form. It influences your sleep, it influences your ibadah, it influences your productivity, it influences your sickness and health, it influences your family, it influences everything. Your mobility, you being able to pr do proper rukur and sujood, all of these are connected. Watch out, watch out, watch out regarding what you put in your belly, oh brothers and sisters. Muslims are supposed to be the healthiest people on this planet. Because our diet is revealed. You go, Quito, uh, Pito, Cito, Macalito. Everybody comes up with their own diet. You know, this. Ah, wah, wah. Calm down, uh, Juju. Don't uh, uh, give me a headache. Our diet is prophetic. Our diet is divine, revealed by Allah. <laughs> the Muslim is a balanced human being to begin with. You never go to any extreme. And if you eat like the Prophet Sallallahu you best believe you're going to be in shape and you're going to be just fine, just fine. But we don't observe. Every time we eat, you got to pack it, baby, especially in Ramadan, mashaAllah, tabarakallah. Maybe some of you just got off the, the sufra right now with a, a good 6,000 calories. Didn't leave anything on the table you didn't try. Oh, let me see that samosa. Oh, how cute. Oh, let me see this one over there. Okay, give, give me a plate of that. What about this? What about that? You're about to suffocate and, and, and choke and die. The food is coming out of your nose and ears. And Ramadan. So Ramadan, Allah, I was fasting all day, brother. MashaAllah, alhamdulillah. Slept half of the day and, you know, then you ate uh, the, the half of the fridge when you broke your fast. And Come on now. That's not fasting. That's just being funny. And we got to stop being funny every time, every, every Ramadan we speak about this. Some of you have been paying attention, alhamdulillah, and some of you don't listen. Let's listen. Huh? Let's listen. Come on. Stop being tough. And then remember death and being rotten, being khalas. No more soul in your body. Whosoever wants the akhirah will leave the adornment of the dunya. You will keep only the share that is dedicated for you. You're not going to invest all of your effort into the zina of the dunya and forget about the akhirah. Whosoever does all of that, then he has truly been shy and bashful before Allah the way Allah deserves it. Properly. Check. How many of us can tick that box? Babe? How many of us can tick that box? Huh? All of them? All of them? Allah Allahumstaan. Oh, which reminds me, uh, the mind and what it, what, it, what it takes in, just rest assured that everybody who eventually winds up leaving Islam and becoming some other, you know, follower of some other faith, specifically the, those who turn atheists, it all started with the junk that they were feeding their brains. Oh, I'm just curious. Oh, let me just read. I just want to, you know, have awareness. And then if they don't have the proper foundation, they get swept away. So that's why the scholars were very particular about listening to people of innovation and, and misguided people because you don't know where they're going to twist your brain. You don't know where they're going to you know, put their poison. You got to be careful. It's no joke. Tayyip, among the etiquettes with Allah is obviously that you don't dedicate any worship to other than Allah. You have sincerity. And that requires a sip of coffee. Why am I saying this? Because we have a misconception about sincerity. A lot of us think sincerity is that you do something for the sake of Allah and someone else or something else. And I would like to tell you that that fails sincerity in the ultimate sense. In fact, sincerity is the exact opposite of that. In fact, sincerity is you do something only for the sake of Allah and you could not care less about everybody else. Zero. That means that you fundamentally would like to hide your good deeds because if you want sincerity, then you don't want to open the door for people to be like, oh, bravo, admiring you and clapping for you and praising you because that need that you need, that you want to fill is exactly what negates ikhlas. Because we all know in the hadith of Qudsi, فَمَنْ عَمِلَ عَمَلًا أَشْرَكَ فِيهِ مَعْيَ غَيْرِي تَرَكْتُهُ وَشِرْكُ Whosoever does a deed seeking the pleasure of someone else but me, I will leave him alone in the shirk. يعني you do it for the sake of Allah and for someone else? No bueno, Jose. Not gonna fly. So it's strictly for the sake of Allah. That's why 
our righteous predecessors were very keen on hiding their good deeds, concealing their good deeds. It wasn't something that they wanted to make public. Sometimes it's inevitable when you want to encourage the people, Alhamdulillah, but you gotta always check yourself. Check yourself before you wreck yourself. Always make sure that you have that inspection in place that this is for the sake of Allah and you're just trying to be a good example for others. Nothing more. Nothing more than that. If, if you reach another level of, I want to be a good example where they want the people to praise you and be happy for you, khalas, we seek refuge with Allah, the good deed is gone. And that is su adab ma'Allah. Because those people ask yourself the question, what are they going to do for you on Yawm Al-Qiyamah? Nothing. Nothing. And if all of your effort has gone down a drain because you associated someone else with Allah, then you got a problem. A serious one. Among the etiquettes of Allah, uh, having good manners with Allah and adab ma Allah, is that you, you observe certain terminology. And we learn from the Prophet Sallallahu that he did not like it when someone said, Ma sha Allah wa sha fulan. Whatever Allah wills and, and you know, such and such person wills. Or, uh, you know, any expression of this nature. I, I was saved by Allah and you. I rely upon Allah and you. All of this, uh, this using the, the preposition, not a preposition, the, uh, I forgot what it is right now. And, in this context, is actually an expression of shirk. It's not major shirk unless you truly believe it. But it's minor shirk and it's something that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam greatly disliked. Conjunction, I think. Anyways, you should not ever use expressions of this nature. It's always, ma sha Allah, thumma fulan. Whatever Allah wills, then such and such. Then, because it's ultimately to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Similarly, a lot of people don't use the term insha'Allah the way it's supposed to be used. Insha'Allah is one of the most fundamental expressions to be used. It's in the Quran. Don't say about anything, I'm going to do this tomorrow, except after you say insha'Allah. And that is not restricted to what you're going to do tomorrow. It could be something you're going to do in a minute. You should always say inshallah, teach our children to say inshallah. Now the only time Muslims say inshallah is when they're not going to do something. Are you coming tomorrow inshallah? And he knows he's not coming. So we've actually abused the term inshallah and belittled its value. So that it's used, even non-Muslims, they know if the Muslim says inshallah, forget it, you're not going to see anything. Wallah, that's sad. That's sad that the people are, will have to say something like this. Allah al-musta'an. Hey, among the important manners with Allah, and this is one of my favorite, honestly, and it has to do with also choice of words, is uh, that you never attribute anything negative to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the prophets exemplified this in the most beautiful way ever. If you read the Quran from the beginning till the end, you will be mesmerized and astonished at how particular the prophets were in their choice of words with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it exemplified the ultimate type of manners and mannerism. For example, Ibrahim alayhi salatu salam. He says, وَإِذَا مَرِدْتُ فَهُوَ يَشْفِي And when I become sick, he heals me. He is uh, uh, the pronoun referring to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Type. We all know Who's the one who allows you to become sick? مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ مِنْ دَاءٍ إِلَّا أَنزَلَ لَهُ دَوَاءٍ Allah did not send down any illness or disease except that He sent down a cure. عَلِيمَهُ مَنْ عَلِيمَهُ وَجَهِلَهُ مَنْ جَهِلَهُ Those who know it, know it. Those who don't know it, don't know it. طيب. This hadith signifies that Allah is the one who sends down illness. Obviously, you don't get ill without the will of Allah because nothing in this world happens without the will of Allah. So technically speaking, when I become sick, he attributed the illness to himself, like he got himself sick. It is Allah Azza wa Jal who cures him. Ayyub had something similar. 
واذكر عبدنا أيوب إذ نادى ربه أني مسني الشيطان بنصب وعذاب and mention our slave Ayyub when he called on to Allah said verily the shaitan has afflicted me with uh, torment and, and, and pain so he attributed what happened to him to the shaitan even though we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who tested Ayyub with what he tested him with this was the adab of Ayyub with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he lost, he lost his son, Benjamin, and he lost his sight as a, as a result of the pain he had to go through. And he used to cry because of the loss of Yusuf. And I mean, he, he had a tough life. And yet he used to say, Verily, really, I, I restrict, I restrict my complaint and my agony to Allah. That's why the scholars say like Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, said that a shakwa ila Allah la tuna fi sabr al jameel complaining to Allah does not negate beautiful patience beautiful patience that you don't complain that means you don't complain to the creation as for Allah you should pour your heart out every single time in complaining and it's not considered lack of manners with Allah it is actually good manners with Allah that you complain to Allah but look at Yaqub alayhi salam he wouldn't announce it to the people he wanted to keep it between him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of good manners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What about al dhabih Do you know who al dhabih is? I'll give you a second to think about it. Man huwa al dhabih Ismail. Ibrahim saw in a dream that he is going to slaughter him. Qala ya bunayya inni ara fil manami anni athbahuk. He said, my son, I see in the dream that I am going to slaughter you. فَنْظُرْ مَاذَا تَرَى What do you say about this? قَالَ يَا أَبَتِ فَعَلْ مَا تُؤْمَرْ سَتَجِدُنِي إِنْ شَاءَ اللَّهُ مِنَ الصَّابِرِينَ Allahu Akbar. He says, my father, do what you are commanded. You will find me, inshaAllah, among those who are patient. Can you have any better manners with Allah? And I am now speaking to the youth who are listening to me. The youth. Anyone who has parents that are alive, actually not even the youth, the whole thing. Anyone who has parents that are alive, please, please pay attention. Learn. A father is telling his son, I am going to slaughter you. I'm going to what? Slaughter you. What does he say in return? Do what you are told. Now, your parents tell you, throw the trash, turn off this uh, PlayStation, eat, sleep, jump, squat, push up, anything they tell you. And the fundamental reply to maybe 90% of even good Muslims is far from abshir. Sure, my pleasure, my parents, mm, I love you. It is resistance, 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 argument, going back and forth, negotiation. They make you climb the mountain, go down the hill, climb another mountain, Himalaya, go down the hill, go diving 60 feet under the water, go back up, get in a helicopter, jump with a parachute, bungee jumping. You, go, you feel like you went through 18 roller coasters before you get what you asked for. That's how most of us treat our parents. Which Jannah would we like to enter with this attitude? Isn't it enough already? Isn't it enough? Shouldn't we have some shame? Ibrahim tells Ismail, I'm going to slaughter you. And he has a knife and he puts him down. He... خلاص, he put his head down and he was and his son is in the, in the ultimate state of submission. Allah Azza wa Jal revealed that he does not have to do it. When Ibrahim, you have made the you have materialized the, the, the dream. You you fulfilled the command that you were given. Where where are you from Ismail? Where are you from Ismail? Well, we, we don't want you to be Ismail. But can you at least be a, a, a decent child to your parents or Muslim? 
whether you're old or young, whether you're male or female, alhamdulillah in Islam, these are the only options we have. If we were speaking to another crowd, we would have to mention at least another seven types of people who identify themselves as. Which is another interesting point, but I don't want to... I don't want to divert from the topic. I hope I hope I'm making myself clear with this with this issue because it's it's painful and we all go through it. It's a reminder to truly understand what our parents deserve. If you want Allah to bless you in your life, if you want sustenance from Allah, if you want support from Allah, if you want paradise that Allah promised, believe me, your parents are the greatest door through which you can enter this. And if I were to give you a lecture about this with all the evidences from the Quran and the Sunnah, which I have in the past, then you would understand why. But in brevity and in brief, please take heed in this Ramadan. Learn how to be submissive. Learn how to say yes with a smile. Not a fake smile, not sarcastic, genuine and sincere. If there's any type of manners with Allah that you need to live by, then your parents are right there. وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّا وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا And your Lord has proclaimed that none should be worshipped but Him and you should be excellent and dutiful to your parents. You know the rest of the ayat about lowering your wing of mercy to them and not saying off to them and not screaming at them. Today, children have lost this. And the Muslim youth don't exemplify the teachings of Islam. And sadly, as a byproduct, we've lost our track. Uh, and, and the track that leads to paradise in this regard. So I remind myself and you to take this matter pretty seriously. Another example of the ex exemplification of manners with Allah is the jinn. The jinn said, and I love this ayah so much, subhanallah al-azim, this ayah you can reflect on for days and months. وَإِنَّا لَا نَدْرِي أَشَرٌ أُرِيدَ بِمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ أَمْ أَرَادَ بِهِمْ رَبُّهُمْ رَشَدًا And we don't know. Is evil intended for those on earth? Is evil intended is, is attributed to the unknown. They didn't say what the source is going to be. Could it be that evil has been intended and, and decreed for people on earth? Or is it that their Lord intends guidance for them? Subhanallah. The jinn. You know, now when in, in our culture, when someone, you know, when a child is. Too crazy, they say, Jinni ula jinni, ta'al hana. Walad la jinn. Sub billah jinni al walad. Say, he's like a jinn, he's, he's all over the place. You know, it's like smoke is fire. The jinn had this manners with Allah, the believers among them, of course. So, where are we from that? Where are we from those traits and qualities? So, in, in reality, uh, brothers and sisters, the uh, manners with Allah are, are a lot that we need to be mindful of. And we need to start somewhere. And I think for many people, Ramadan has always been the ideal time. In my case, I found Islam in reality in Ramadan. And before I came here, I was listening to a story of a Christian, Coptic Christian, Egyptian, who became a Muslim. And that's a very difficult thing to do in Egypt because the Coptic Christians are pretty, pretty stern and maybe violent against the reverts. He also found Islam uh, last year in Ramadan. And Ramadan is always an opportunity to excel because the shayateen have been chained and put away and you have the ability to start something good and inshallah maintain it afterwards. So I invite myself and you to make this Ramadan that special one. Let's make this Ramadan that special one. Little effort with determination and resolve and tawfiq and success granted by Allah can go a long way. And even if you don't achieve, the fact that you made an effort is something Allah Azza wa will reward you for and appreciate. 
Allahu shakur, Allah is very thankful. Whereas when we don't move a finger, we don't make an effort, then we have miserably failed. And if we fail in Ramadan, then it is more likely that we will fail after Ramadan. Not guaranteed, but probable. So, two things I want you to take away from this talk. First of all, let us make sure that Islam is the governing force in our house to the best of our ability. And second of all, let those who have parents remember what I said earlier and start a new page with your parents for your own good. Your parents love you. Wallahi, they love you. I would speak on behalf of 99% of the parents. There are a weird 1% freaks who don't for whatever reason. That's none of my business. But 99% of parents love their children sincerely and want the best for them. If you act accordingly, they will appreciate it. Sooner or later, you will, you will see the, the fruits of your effort. But if you don't, then don't blame anyone but yourself. At some point, you're going to be on your own. And if you have a bad relationship with your parents, the chances of you being successful in both worlds are very, very unlikely. Notice what I said. In both worlds. Because Allah might have the dunya written for you. It's going to come as a slave. It's coming bowing and prostrating before you. The dunya. But it doesn't mean that you're going to get the akhirah. If you want both, then you better fix it up with your parents right now. So inshallah, the next episode, we will be discussing how to have proper manners with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Prepare yourself for that. Uh, make sure that you share this with others. Make sure that you invite others as well. Let us spread the word uh, and try to gain reward. Remember, any good deed that you make, where you forward something authentic and reliable, notice that everything is from the Quran and the authentic sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. It's not just some yapping. This is the type of material that you want to share with others so that you can see it on Yawm Al-Qiyam. The more people listen and the more they adhere and the more they apply, it's all in your book of deeds. Instead of the lazy approach of getting a, a message on WhatsApp, you don't know what the authenticity of the content and then you just forward it to 600 people on your contact list and then you gain the sin of, of distorting Islam and the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. This, these are the things that are worthy. Not just me, any authentic, reliable material is worthy of being shared. And so share it so that we can all get the reward. I'm very eager to get as much reward as possible because of my many shortcomings. I need to, I need to balance them out. I'm sure you might be feeling similarly, so let's act accordingly. Zakum Allah khair. 